It's rotational grazing time again here at Lanessa Farms. Let's take some time to talk about everything and how we make everything come together. Hey everyone, it's Tim from Lanessa Farms Specialty and Heirloom Livestock. Thanks for joining me again today. So it's rotational grazing time here on Lanessa Farms, and I wanted to take some time to walk with you today out in our pastures and talk about how we bring everything together and how we make everything work. So we're in Northwest Indiana and we can reasonably sustain our animals on free range pasture. For ballpark, we would say from the beginning of May, somewhere to Memorial Day, all the way until roughly October 31st, maybe a little bit earlier. You know, there's a lot of videos out there and a lot of people that'll tell you how many animals you can have per acre, how much a certain amount of land can sustain. While we can give you ballpark answers, the reality is, is that it depends on a multitude of factors. How much rain have you had that year? What kind of crops do you have actually in the ground? How good of a stand do you have? What's the nutritional value of what you have? What do you do for fertilizer? How well are you fertilizing your ground? You know, what kind of soil do you have? Do you have sand? Do you have clay? Do you have really poor quality ground? So all of that matters. Right now we are rotational grazing approximately 30 breeding ewes and 20 breeding does. We put them on one half acre, that's one slash two, so a half acre paddock at a time, and we rotate them through that half acre paddock will last them roughly two to three weeks. This pasture right here, this paddock that we're on right here, we put them out on this a few days ago. And you can see they've trampled some of it down, but they haven't eaten a whole lot yet. We've got a good stand of orchard grass in here. We have alfalfa and we have a lot of clover. It will take them about three weeks to get this eaten down. Again, a lot of this depends on the weather. This was a very tall paddock. It was up to about my chest in some places. On a drought year, or if this wasn't fertilized properly, it may only last them a week. So there is no, I guess the point that I'm trying to make is there is no one size fits all when it, people say, well, how, con how long can I leave them on an area? When do I need to move them? You need to keep an eye on the pasture itself. Once it gets down to about, you know, to where they're eating stubs, it's about this long. The main thing that you wanna do is you wanna keep them from eating down in the dirt. You don't want them down in the dirt, getting into that soil. They're gonna do damage to the root bed. They're gonna do damage to the plants and then they're gonna set themselves up for things like worm load and things like that. So the whole point of rotational grazing is to keep them worm free, keep them healthy keep them thrifty and keep them going. So if you take a look around inside this half acre paddock right now, there's one thing that you will notice is that it's 10 o'clock in the morning and no one's over here eating. What happens generally speaking is they'll be in here eating maybe for a couple hours in the morning, a couple hours at night. There's enough in here that it can really fill them up so they're never really hungry. And then they'll go lay out. We've got portable shelters for our animals to lay in and they prefer to just chill out in the sun. Why that is, I do not know. I think to myself, I'm like, gosh, it's 80 something degrees outside, 90 degrees, and they're sitting out in the sun. We have some black asphalt regrinds up here that actually is a, the hottest spot you can possibly think of and the goats just lay up there all day long. It's quite interesting. Lindy, if you can pin, uh, pan over there and show them, you can see that they're just laying up there having a good old time, just soaking up the sun. We've got portable shelters like the one over here. We've got a few of those out. And for the most part, none of them are too interested in it. Now, one thing that is interesting that I will talk about here is we do have a sacrificial area here. This is a little less than a half an acre. This is probably one of our crummier parts of our, of our pasture. Uh, it holds a little bit of water. The soil quality isn't too good. And we use this as a standard point to do our rotational grazing off of. This way we can keep permanent structures on this, we can keep our water on this and everything else, and then we just kind of build out from here. Uh, you don't necessarily have to do that. It's just a little bit more legwork if you move things around. So again, you know, these animals tend to hang out here on this more permanent section during the day, and then at night and in the morning, they move over here where all the fresh stuff is and they start eating off of that. How do we keep our animals inside these half acre paddocks? That's the next thing that we're gonna talk about. I'm gonna show you our portable fencing that we use from Premier One, and we're gonna talk about the charging system. So basically, if you can imagine, we have four 
half acre parcels that are attached together that just form a simple square with a cross through the middle of it. On each quadrant of the two acres, we have a half acre uh, parcel. So we have a half acre there, a half acre there, a half acre here, and a half acre there. This is our sacrificial parcel that we use just to give them a general place to always be at and to stay. We have water on this parcel. And again, the soil quality is kind of crummy. And so we just let them eat this down. They usually won't eat this down too much. I actually keep it mowed down so there's not too much for them to eat over here. That way they're more inclined to go where the actual food is, as you can see uh, in an area like this. So we'll just rotate through. I will go uh, for this parcel, again, two to three weeks, move to the next parcel for two to three weeks, move to the next parcel for two to three weeks, and then I just start all over again. Uh, the thing I like about the sacrificial parcel that we have up here is that when it comes time to move them around or to set up new parcels, I can simply put them in here, confine them, and then get the area set up that I need to. I have enough temporary fencing that I can set up four quadrants and leave them set up all the time, but you don't have to. You can just have enough fencing that you can build up one section at a time, run them into that sacrificial parcel, parcel, hold them in there, build your fence, release them, and then when it comes time, you just tear it down and move it to the next parcel. I think that is probably the most cost-effective way to deal with this if you don't wanna spend the extra money. You know, for these fencing sections, for the permanent that we talked about for a 150-foot section, you're looking at approximately 200 to $225, depending on which type you wanna get. What we like to do is, and as we got started, what we did was we basically uh, just bought a little bit every year. We bought just enough to get by, and then every year we buy a couple new strands, and then we go from there. So this is Premier One's permanetting. There's multiple different types of netting that you can get. We're gonna talk about a few of the different ones. I really like the permanetting. It's it's a little bit heavy, heavier duty. Um, it's got a double step in spike that you can see right here. I can, you know, it's pretty well stuck in the ground, but there you go. There's that double step in spike. I can put that in and, and simply press it down into the ground um, with my foot. Works fairly well. Uh, this is a pretty heavy duty system that we have here. It is 48 inches high. I don't really think that that's necessary uh, for most sheep or goats, but it's the height that it comes in and we think that's acceptable. You can also get drive-in posts for those of you that live in areas where it may be extremely rocky or extremely hard uh, soil. These connect to one another relatively easily. So again, when it comes to the corner posts, we've been over this in some of our other videos, the easiest way to do this is to drive a T-post and put a two inch piece of PVC over top of it. It'll insulate the entire post and you can pull nice tight corners around it. So in the springtime, when we've determined which areas of our pasture we're going to use for rotational grazing, I will actually go out and drive T-posts in the corners and I will just mark them and leave them in place all year all for the entire season. That way I'm not re-guessing and driving T-posts every time. So even though I may not have fencing in place, I always have my corners in place. That way it's as simple as eyeballing it, go to the corners and set things up, tear them down, leave the T-posts in place, and then go back to them again later on in the season when I need to. Two people can easily put up this fencing together in a very short amount of time. The sections of fencing generally Depending on what type you get, they can come in 150 foot sections. I know the permanent comes in 150 foot sections. The, uh, some of the other ones actually come in over 200, and 200 foot sections, 225 foot sections, uh, depending on the type that you wanna get. Uh, they, they connect rather easily with one another. They've got some clip ends that go together. We'll talk about that when we get up here and I'll kind of show you uh, how that works. And overall, you know, the fencing is pretty tough. Uh, it stands up quite a bit to the animals. The squares are nice and small to where your goats, generally speaking, aren't gonna try to get their heads through. So you can see every end of these uh, has a little clip and all you have to do to connect them is basically clip them together. Now, now you can see they're actually gonna have quite a bit of length together. What I do is just cross them over one another, wrap them around a few times 
and then link them together just like this. Just for safety's sake, we also include a zip tie. Uh, we put a zip tie together to hold these. Um, but overall, yep, works really, really well. Now you will notice we have quite a bit of a, of a load on this fence. Um, and we're gonna talk more about that when we get to the charger. But you can see we've got quite a bit of material actually touching this fence. Even with all of this still touching this fence, we're still putting out about 3000 volts uh, consistently, which is more than enough to keep these animals from doing anything that we don't want them to do. So again, this is the permanent. Um, it's made kind of to be put in place and left there. It's not that it's difficult to move. It's just a little heavier. We can go look at a couple other types of their netting just so you get an idea of the difference between what you're looking at. So this is just a different type of the electric fence from Premier. Um, this one is Electrostop. It is only 36 inches high and these are the drivable posts. You can use a dead blow hammer on these and actually drive them right into the ground and they are a single spike. The other variant that we'll look at is similar to this and it's just a step in double spike like the one that we had looked at before. So you can see here's the three different types actually that come together. This is the permanent. You can see it's 48 inches high. This is our uh, other netting here. This is either 36 or 38 inches high. Again, very, very similar. Uh, the permanent, you can see that the squares are actually a little bit smaller. On the electrostop, they're a little bit bigger. This is the electrostop drive-in. This is the electrostop with the step-in that's just got the similar two prongs to the one that we looked at before and this is the drivable and again everywhere where we have our corners we simply uh, take a t-post cover with two inch pvc and then we just use zip ties to hold our corners together so there's a couple different options you're going to have depending on what kind of setup you have now if you have this close to your home you can very easily uh, have this set up to where uh, you can electrically hook this up, hook it up to just regular AC power. We don't do that uh, for a couple different reasons. One, we have frequent power outages in our area and we just don't want to deal with that. Secondly, we like to be able to set up our netting wherever in the heck we want and we don't have to worry about having an AC power hookup. So what we use is a fence charger that runs off of a deep cycle battery. We actually have two deep cycle batteries that we keep at all times. We change them out weekly. So while one is up in the shop getting charged on the trickle charger, the other one's actually out hooked up to the fence and running. So let's go over and take a look at our charging system really quick so you can get an idea of what we're looking at. Hey everyone, thanks for joining us again today. I know a lot of you have questions and chances are we have the answers that you need. And there's a few different ways that you can go about getting those answers. The first thing that I would advise to you is to follow us on Facebook. Um, just do a search for Lanessa Farms. Check out Lanessa Farms Tack Box. This is our forum. This is a group <laughs> where you can come on there. You can ask any questions. We have lots of individuals from all over the United States and the world, including veterinarians, individuals that show animals, and everyone in between. Uh, you are welcome there and you are welcome to ask any questions that you may have. It's helpful if you ask your questions on the forum because chances are other people have questions just like yours um, and it just helps to kind of bring us all together. The other thing that we have is every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Central Standard Time, we have a, a live stream on YouTube uh, where it's just an open forum where you can ask questions and get answers as well. So with that being said, let's get back to the video. So this is our Speedrite 3000. You can get this through Premiere. You can also get this online. This runs on a deep cycle battery. It comes with everything that you need. And we just keep ours in a Tupperware container. You can see we've also got all of our tools and everything else in here. That way when we're doing work out here, it's just here. A couple different settings that you can set the speed right on. That will come with your owner's manual. Basically, you can set it to fast. You can set it to slow. You can set it just to regular charge. And again, it just hooks up and runs right off of a deep cycle battery. So it's as simple as one lead hooks up to your positive, one lead hooks up to your negative. You still need to drive a ground rod. The positive comes off and attaches right to my fence. I like to just gator clip it right to that union that we talked about earlier. And then I drive a ground rod 
and I just hook my ground right up to that. As you can see, I just use, I just keep my ground rod driver right on top of it when I'm not using it. It keeps it up and out of the dirt. A little pricey to get this, and then you're gonna have the cost of the batteries and the cost of the charger, but I feel that this is worth it. We've had these batteries, as long as you use a really nice uh, trickle charger for your deep cycle batteries, they will last you for years and years. Now, you absolutely must use a deep cycle battery. These batteries are made to be charged and drained and charged and drained. You can't use a regular battery. It won't work over time. It'll just burn it up. Um, so again, the link for this is gonna be in the description below. You can get it through Premier, but you can get it through other companies as well. We've talked about our fence charger in the past or our fence tester in the past. This is the one that we prefer and it just shows us where we're at. The other thing to keep in mind with the Speedrite charger is the amount of joules that it puts out. A solar power charger just will not work appropriately for these fences and for the amount of fencing that we have. It puts out a lot of volts on paper, but at the end of the day, the joules just aren't there. So that amount of force that it's pushing through the fence just isn't there. We have a tremendous weed load on this fence right now. Um, and if you look here and see, we're gonna be at about 2.9 thousand volts. And we're at 2.7. So earlier this morning we were at 2.9, but this is still more than enough uh, to give them a good shock if they touch it and to keep them away from it. Again, overall, I think, I think the speed ride is definitely the way to go. If you have any questions or concerns regarding that, just let me know and I'll do my best to answer them. So these are our watering tubs. We actually have water access down here. For those of you that don't have water access, you're gonna have to devise a way to get water out to your pasture. Um, and that can be done just with simple five gallon buckets. That can be done with an IBC tote, a 250 gallon tote, maybe in the back of a truck or in a payload or a skid steer or whatever. The only other thing that we actually keep out here for our animals is free choice sodium bicarb. Um, that's that baking soda. They eat this as they need it and it keeps them uh, from getting bloat uh, from a lot of the legumes that we have out on our pasture. I guess the one thing that I will want you to know is that you know, as long as your animals aren't overly hungry, they are usually doing just fine. We have this period of time when we very first put them out on pasture that we wanna be extremely cautious and make sure that we have them as full as we can get them before we put them out on pasture to keep them from overeating and getting bloat. Um, but once they're out on the pasture and they're going well, once you start rotational grazing them, as long as they're getting an adequate amount of nutrition, you don't have to worry about them overeating. So we only have our experienced ewes out here on pasture. We don't have any of our yearling ewes or yearling does out on pasture. And the reason for that is, is we wanna be able to breed our uh, ewe lambs and our doe kids uh, that first fall. And the way that we do that is we keep them on dry lot. Um, we feed them very heavily and we wanna get them up to about 75% of their mature weight before they get pregnant and start having babies. So as far as we're concerned, the rotational grazing is just something that we do for our adults. We have ran some ewe lambs and some doe kids on pasture before. We've got a couple experimental uh, ones out here this year. Uh, historically, we found that they just don't grow as well uh, without the grain and the additional nutrition. It's not even comparable. But if you're in a position where you don't mind holding them over a little bit longer before you breed them, or you simply don't want to feed them any kind of grain, then by all means, you can put them out here on pasture. Once they've been weaned for a couple months, once they've been off a of mom for a few months, uh, you can reintroduce them and put them back out here. That's definitely an option for you. With that being said, I hope you enjoyed some of the additional information we gave you today. I know a lot of you are gonna have some questions. If you do, that's fine. Let us know, we'll be more than happy to answer them for you and make a video for you perhaps. I'm Tim from Lanessa Farm Specialty and Heirloom Livestock. Thanks for joining me again today, and I look forward to seeing you again next time.